Hello, welcome to a new episode of Germany in Focus, a podcast made possible by members of The Local. Today we're talking about the impact of a new flight ticket tax on consumers in Germany and how this and other costs are affecting budget air travel. We'll explain some of the big happenings in Germany this May, including that it's a bumper holiday month and transport changes. When foreigners move to Germany, they might be drawn to the bigger cities like Hamburg or Berlin, but we are going to chat about the positives of choosing a smaller city, and today we'll focus on Nuremberg. We'll hear about what it's like to bring up children in a bilingual household in Germany, and finally, we'll make some German noises that will hopefully help us sound more like locals. I'm Rachel Loxon, and I'm in Berlin today with journalist Paul Krantz and Imogen Goodman. Hi, how's it going? Hello. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, I'm most Mostly enjoying the hot weather. It's a little bit of a shock to the system, but I'm very, very ready for May. I love May in Germany. It just feels like it just kicks off this whole couple of months of just street party after street party, <laughs> picnics in the sun, people dipping their first toes in the lakes. So it really does feel like a really exciting time. And it, I, I really do think it's the best time to be in Berlin. So really excited about that. Yeah, a good time to visit. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. I've always- always just love watching the foliage fill out at this yeah. time of year. Like everything just turns super green and Definitely. from week to week, it's like the trees are just more and more full. Definitely. I love that. From my balcony, you can see I'm kind of right on the in the treetops almost. So that feels yeah. great. It is really nice, but I am wondering if it peaked too soon this year because, <laughs> <laughs> because it's like all the trees are so green, all the flowers are out, everything's out. And I'm like, this has got to last us all the way through August, you know? It does. <laughs> it does. I mean, uh, that's one way of thinking about it. <laughs> the green kind of changes over time is something I noticed. Like right now we have this really pure, fresh kind of light green. And then as the summer goes on, it turns kind of darker mm. and darker. And then by August, it's like, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's like this dark, deep forest green. Yeah. It's, it's not so fresh anymore. Yeah. But still very green. We should do a gardening episode now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's get into it. At the start of May, the German government hiked up the Luftverkehrsabgabe, or aviation tax, by about 20%. This is a tax added to all departures from Germany, and the amount depends on the destination. Obviously, the further you're traveling, the higher the tax is. But what does this tax increase and other costs in Germany around flying mean for consumers and budget air travel? Paul, first of all, can you recap what we need to know about this ticket tax and how it affects passengers? Sure, Rachel. So as you said, the German aviation tax will increase by about 20% as of May 1st. So by the time you're hearing this podcast, it's already happened. In terms of ticket prices, the tax amounts to a cost of 15.53 on European flights or nearly 40 euros on medium haul flights. So those are flights up to 6,000 kilometers or about 70 euros on really long flights. And it's worth noting here that in Germany, an air traffic tax has been in place already since 2011. So those numbers you've just heard are the total amount of tax that will be applied after the tax hike. So that's not how much the prices are going to increase. That's just where the tax will be at. So in terms of actual price hike for customers, this tax is adding about two euros 50 cents for shorter flights or a little over 10 euros for the longer flights. So the tax hike alone really shouldn't break the bank for anyone who can afford a quick vacation or a business trip by flight. And the German government does seem to think that these taxes are really crucial to the country's budget especially in light of some of the recent significant budget gaps we've heard about here. Recent figures show this aviation tax brought in 1.6 billion euros last year, and the government expects this 20% hike to increase that revenue by somewhere between 400 to 580 million euros annually in mm -hmm. the coming years. And what are the airlines saying about it all? Well, the airlines are not happy, especially budget airlines like EasyJet and Ryanair that tend to offer some of the cheapest airfares on trans-European travel have said that these additional costs really limit their ability to offer those budget airfares to the customers. Um, I recently got in touch with a representative from EasyJet to ask about the company's perspective on this tax hike. And they told me EasyJet was, quote, disappointed with the increase of the passenger tax 
and that the cost increase will result in higher airfares for consumers and maybe damage Germany's connectivity. Ryanair's marketing chief had stronger words when they spoke to the German press agency recently. They suggested that the German aviation market is broken and that the government lacks a sensible airline policy. But I think it's worth pointing out that despite this tax increase, the aviation industry is among the most undertaxed and overly subsidized sectors of the economy, both in Germany and abroad. For example, airlines aren't really charged either VAT or kerosene taxes when they fly between most cities in Europe, whereas train operators are regularly charged for both of those. And additionally, in 2020, German taxpayers paid 12.5 billion euros in support of the aviation sector, according to a report by Investigate Europe. So if you've ever wondered why train tickets are so expensive compared to plane tickets, well, that's a big part of your answer. Mm, Was that to save the airlines during the pandemic? I think some of that was, of yeah. But but every year, honestly, there's a huge amount of taxpayer money going to airlines, mostly on fuel subsidies. Mm-hmm. Do you think then, Paul, we are coming to the end of budget air travel in Germany, maybe as we know it? Well, I think it would be a bit overstated to go that far, at least for now. As we've mentioned, customers are realistically looking at a ticket price increase between 250 and 10 euros per ticket. So... Considering how cheap air travel can be, I think budget prices plus 10 more euros is still realistically budget prices, at least in my opinion. That said, I do think we are seeing a slow but steady trend towards more costly flights. Along with taxes, airport fees are a major concern for airlines. I think a lot of passengers aren't always aware that airports themselves take a lot of money to keep running, and they therefore levy these fees on airlines who pass these costs on to customers. So there's fees for handling costs, for example, or takeoff and landing fees, security check fees, air traffic control fees, among others. EasyJet told me that the airport fees represent about 20% of the cost of every flight. And kind of a fun fact, they noted that the Berlin-Brandenburg airport is among the most expensive airports that they operate from. Really? Yeah, go figure. (laughs) I wonder what Berlin uh, is charging for over there. (laughs) With all of that in mind, at the moment in Germany, we've got this kind of perfect storm for price hikes where inflation is really pushing up the cost of just about everything. And the government is also looking for more tax revenue. And I would also add that as a society, we haven't even really begun to question to what extent we might want to decrease fossil fuel subsidies considering their negative climate impacts. So I do think ultimately, perhaps some years down the line, all of this is going to catch up with the airlines. And so-called budget flights could become a relic of a bygone era, eventually. In the short term, I think plenty of affordable flights will continue to be available to passengers. So listeners who might have loose plans to fly to Greece or Sicily this summer can afford to relax for now, I think. And anecdotally, I do think it looks like ticket prices are up a little bit compared to last year. But I would say that for now, budget air travel is still here. Yeah, I definitely noticed that prices of tickets have gone up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. I think that seems to be to do with the energy price volatility in general. Right, that's right. So that was a major thing last year with suddenly flights feeling like they were costing double. But of course, they still, despite the subsidies, still rely on fuel. So those prices are going to be passed on to the consumer, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, we're still waiting to see cheaper rail travel from the German government. We've got the Deutschland ticket. Don't forget the Deutschland for now. Yeah, regional (laughs) trains, we can go on. Before we carry on with our chat, I'd like to take a moment to ask you to consider supporting our podcast by becoming a member of The Local. We are an independent media outlet and your support is what allows us to produce the news and all of the cultural and practical explainer articles that we write and it allows us to do this podcast. If you'd like to join, you can find a link to a special offer for podcast listeners in the show notes or you can access it directly at thelocal.de slash podcast offer. So as we've been talking about, we are into a new month. And as always, there are a few changes in Germany. So let's get into them. We've already talked about one. That's the ticket tax on flights that's been increased. Imogen, can you tell us what else is important to know this month? 
Well, the first thing you will definitely want to know is that May is absolutely the month of public holidays, uh, so much so that I often struggle to remember all of them. <laughs> um, so by the time this podcast comes out, we'll have just had Labor Day or May Day for Brits, which is just this wonderful, wild celebration in the sun, especially in Berlin, alongside demos in support of workers' rights and the class struggle in general. So then, hot on the heels of that, we've got May 9th, and that's my personal favourite, Christine Himmelfart. <laughs> this is really your personal favourite? <laughs> Just yeah. beca purely because of the name. You can't <laughs> fail to smile when you hear Christy Himmelfart. Yeah, so this is Christ driving to the sky. He's driving to the sky. He's yeah. travelling up there on the, on the big autobahn in the sky. <laughs> So uh, this uh, is less amusingly known as Ascension Day in English. Boo. Mm. So boring. boring. I know. Um, but in Germany, the fun fact about this day is that it also happens to be Father's Day. Uh, so this year is on a Thursday. It's another big public holiday. And traditionally, this is when men roam around the streets lugging these big crates of beer, getting completely paralytic in a kind of touching celebration of paternal love, the true meaning of Father's Day, getting really wasted. And if you're truly integrated as a German man, uh, you will probably always already have booked Friday the 10th off as a Brookentag or a bridging day um, in order to nurse your crippling hangover, as is customary the day after Father's Day. <laughs> that's a good tip. Um, so that is a big, uh, that's obviously a big one. But then, again, hot on the heels of that, we have Mother's Day. That's on the 12th. That does fall on a Sunday. So it isn't a public holiday. Mm. And unfortunately, it isn't a public holiday ever. Anyway. <laughs> in, in Germany. <laughs> double <laughs> double yeah. standards. Oh, God. Yeah, we need to write to someone about this. Who's the family <laughs> minister, Lisa Paus. She'll be getting an angry letter pretty soon. But don't worry. If, you, if you're if you sad about Mother's Day not being a public holiday, you don't have to wait long for the next one. Because on Sunday 19th, we have Finkston or Whitson, and that's followed by Whit Monday or Finkston. Montag. Thanks, Montag, yeah. Uh, which is a public holiday all over Germany. And then finally, as if that wasn't enough, for all those lucky people living in Baden-Württemberg, Hesse, uh, North Rhine-Westphalia, Rhineland-Palatinate and Saarland, and some parts of Thuringian and Saxony, May 30th marks Corpus Christi, uh, which is a big important day in the Catholic calendar. But whether you're religious or not, if you live in these states, you'll still get the day off. So lucky you. <laughs> Amazing. This is a holiday bonanza month. It's a good year for public holidays. It really is. I believe there's a change drivers or people who like to holiday across Europe in their car should know. Yes. So um, among the gamut of changes coming this month, a lot of them do, funnily enough, relate to transport. And there is one really important one for drivers. So motorists and especially commuters in the south of Germany will need to know about a change that relates to driving in Switzerland. Uh, so previously, if you did end up accelerating just a little too hard on a road in the Swiss Alps, perhaps parking in a spot you're not quite supposed to park in in Zurich, for example, you would be able to avoid fines as a German resident. Now, unfortunately, for some motorists, the authorities have now closed this loophole. They've done a cross-border deal. And from May, you'll be fully liable for any speeding or parking fines you receive in Switzerland. There is one slight get-out clause, um, and that's the fact that the new rec regulation only applies for fines over 70 euros or 80 francs. But we all know how expensive uh, Switzerland is. Um, right. For example, if you speed in Zurich, you will face a fine of 430 francs. In Argyll, which is along the German border, you will face a fine of 500 francs. So I don't think you should really uh, hold out hope to escape a fine this way. A lot of the fines are far, far more than 80 francs. Really good to know. Is there anything else you want to flag up for us, Imogen? Yes. So we've covered the motorists and this is one for public transport users and particularly people who use Deutsche Bahn's Strecken Argent app to check for disruptions on rail routes around the country. This app uh, is actually being discontinued this month. It will be discontinued by the time this podcast comes out and all of its functions are then going to be integrated into the DB Navigator app in 
instead. So that's the app where you can check routes, uh, buy tickets, show your rail card, all of those kind of things. The people who do really need to know about this will be the people who actually bought their Deutschland ticket or their 49 euro ticket via the Strecken Agent app. Um, apparently, given that this is Germany, these tickets cannot be transferred to DB Navigator for technical reasons. Mm. Uh, too much of a challenge. So um, unfortunately, the people who did have their ticket there uh, will have their subscription cancelled and will need to set up one using another app. Doesn't have to be DV Navigator, can be a local transport company, just wherever you can buy it. Thanks so much for that, Imogen. Paul, you were also writing this week about a change regarding grocery delivery apps. Can you tell us about that? Right. So unfortunately for convenience fans, the grocery delivery apps Getir and Gorillas will both be discontinued in Germany from the 15th of May. So listeners who lived in Berlin or other big German cities through the pandemic years are probably familiar with these quick delivery services that allow customers to pay for grocery items through a phone app and have them delivered by a bike courier within a matter of minutes. But these businesses have struggled to stay afloat as investment funds have begun to dry up. Gorillas was actually acquired by Getir in 2022, and now Getir has announced that it will leave Germany entirely, as well as the rest of Europe, really, as it looks to focus on expanding in its home state of Turkey. Flink, however, will continue to operate in Germany for the time being, and as the market leader, by a long shot, it just may be your only option for on-demand grocery delivery services going forward. Okay, good to know. Thank you both. Many foreigners moving to Germany may typically head to the, the bigger cities such as Berlin, Munich, Hamburg or Frankfurt. But there's a case for moving to maybe a smaller city that's slightly less obvious. Today, we're focusing on Nuremberg, which has a lot of job opportunities because a few big businesses are within commuting distance, including the likes of Adidas and Siemens. But there's a lot more to this city. Paul, we're turning to you because you spend quite a bit of time there and you wrote about this recently. I will, of course, link to the story in the show notes. But can you tell us about the city, the geography? What's what's the vibe? <laughs> Absolutely. So a bit about Nuremberg first. Uh, it's the second largest city in Bavaria after Munich and has a population of about 550,000 people. It's the biggest city in Franconia, which is a region within the state of Bavaria today. And I hesitate to get too deep into Franconian identity and how it differentiates itself because I'm not an expert here. But I'll just say that Franconia is a region with its own cultural and linguistic heritage. They really kind of identify themselves apart from greater Bavaria. And I've personally been caught saying something along the lines of like, oh, this is Bavaria in Nuremberg and had locals like stop me and correct me like, no. Here is Franconia, actually. Uh, so that's something to be aware of if you ever visit. For some very brief history, Nuremberg is home to an imperial castle, which dates back as far as the year 1050, 1050. Uh, my understanding is that due to its kind of central location in Europe, the Nuremberg Castle became a frequented site for emperors like Frederick II, for example, and served as a sort of unofficial capital in the region. And then later in the 15th and 16th centuries, Nuremberg was kind of at the center of the German Renaissance. Uh, there was like Albrecht Dürer, is this famous German painter that was living there for most of his life. In contemporary history, Nuremberg was an important site for the Nazi party which famously held large party gatherings and rallies there leading up to World War II. And for this reason, the city was also home to the so-called Nuremberg Trials following the war, which is where high-ranking Nazi officials were tried for crimes against humanity. Today, the city is among Germany's popular tourist destinations, in part for the history that I just mentioned, and in part for its kind of ongoing cultural traditions, including a giant Christmas market. It happens to be one of the largest in Europe. And it's also home to a significant population of foreign residents many of whom work for the region's bigger firms that you mentioned, like Adidas or Puma or Siemens. Why do you think foreigners should perhaps consider Nuremberg, Paul? Well, I would certainly recommend it as an easy weekend getaway for people living in Germany, especially for one of the seasonal events like the Volksfest in spring or the Christmas market. I think it makes an easy and fun trip. As a place to live, I think it really depends on what you're looking for. I mean, it's it's quite clean and quiet compared to the bigger cities in Germany, but it's still a city and it comes with the modern comforts of urban living. So in this way, it can be nice for some people. For me, one big plus about it is it's a very green city. You really don't have to go far from the city center to find, you know, lush green forests and lakes to swim in. It's also very walkable. If I think about how I move around Berlin, 
if I'm leaving my neighborhood, it's always like a 45 minute. It doesn't matter if I'm on a train or my bike or in a car, like it's always 45 minutes to go to the other side of town. And if I think about Nuremberg, I would say it's it's more like 15 minutes. Mm. Uh, you can walk across the old town in about that much time. And when you also add on the the U-Bahns and the, the trams and the buses, then you can really get pretty much anywhere in the city in like 15 or 20 minutes. So commute times are, are low. And yeah, in my opinion, it's like the perfect size for a city in some ways. Obviously, compared to Berlin, the nightlife is very limited. I haven't been to any clubs there, but there are quite a few bars to check out. And so I would say, considering its size, it's got some decent options. Personally, I think Nuremberg would be a, a nice place to live for someone who's interested in a kind of quiet and outdoorsy lifestyle or maybe for people who are looking to start a family in Germany. Um, there's also some good international schools there, and the city itself is generally family friendly. I have heard from a few young foreigners that living there can be a little bit boring, especially if you're focused on nightlife and social activities. You're probably better off in Berlin. That sounds great, Paul. I, how long does it take to get from Berlin, for example, like on the train? If you take a ICE train, it takes about three hours. If you're okay. lucky, it could be like two hours, 45 minutes. More often, it might be like three, three and a half hours. Yeah. Um, if you're traveling on the Deutschland ticket, that's an all-day journey. That's oh, like eight course. hours and five transfers. Yeah. I did it once. It's rough. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it must be, what, about like two hours from Munich? Yeah. Around. Yeah. On, on ICE, again, it's like one hour, one hour and a half, um, but two hours on a bus or regional trains. It's quite accessible from Leipzig as well. That's yeah. that tends to be where the Berlin, Berlin train goes. So kind of anywhere in central Germany, it's pretty accessible for. Have you visited Imogen? I have not. Um, aside from traveling through there um, on the way to Munich, um, I have heard some wonderful things about it, though. And I think the old medieval city center looks absolutely stunning. As Paul mentioned, for those who don't know, Nuremberg Christmas Market is the Christmas market to go to in Germany. So I guess being resident there would be a perk because you could go every year without having to leave your hometown. Another reason I'd, I'd quite like to visit is that Nuremberg is not too far away from another small city that's really on my bucket list to visit. That's the historic university town of Regensburg, uh, which is actually a UNESCO World Heritage Site and also happens to be the home of the Sausage Dog or Dackel Museum, <laughs> uh, which we uh, talked about on another podcast. So two re reasons to visit Regensburg as well. And uh, yeah, just speaking of sausages, as perhaps the only meat eater here in the podcast. I also booth, enjoy a sausage from okay. time to time. Excellent, excellent. All right, <laughs> I well, have I've been got known to sometimes then. eat meat sausage now and again. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, then we'll all hopefully agree that the bratwurst in this region is just the best in Germany. I think so. Is that a controversial opinion? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't know. I think Turingi I might, I might disagree. Hey, yeah. This is true, but you have the Nuremberger Bratwurst yeah. as well. Um, so I they're don't... just different styles, right? Slightly different. Yeah. The Nuremberger ones are all about these small little, yeah, the little the super. Uh, yeah, Ooh. they're like super herbal. I would say like a little more strong flavor. Mm -hmm. I think they feel are... yeah. They remind me a bit more of British sausages, perhaps. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> but I love them, and I think that's another perk of living in that region. So. Love uh, those are my two cents. Right. We have to also do a whole podcast dedicated to sausages. <laughs> <laughs> it just do. reminded me. I mean, maybe not a whole episode. But oh, perhaps a sausage survey, I think. A reader yeah. survey, a, a listener survey. Let us know if you guys want to answer that. If you have strong sausage-based opinions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, excellent. Thank you both. One topic that many parents in Germany think about, especially when one or both of them has a migration background, is the languages their children are learning and speaking. So what should you think about if you want your children to grow up speaking more than one language in Germany? Imogen, we recently asked readers of The Local about their experiences of raising children in a bilingual home. What did they say? The first thing to mention is that there was really a fascinating range of stories from our readers and such an incredibly diverse range of mother tongues. So we heard from readers who spoke Native American, Ute, 
to their children, people who spoke Croatian, Italian, Spanish, Singaporean, English. So this hugely diverse range of languages that people are speaking. But all of them had one thing in common. Uh, They all stressed how important it was to simply kind of try and trust the process of language acquisition, how natural it is for children, and really have faith in your child's incredible ability to pick up languages at this early age. Don't try and force it, in other words. Uh, So Paul, who lives in Munich and is married to a German, um, actually said that his oldest child just naturally started speaking English at the age of three, having heard it so much at home. So she was actually fluent in both German and English by the age of four. Um, And apparently his younger twins are now following suit and becoming bilingual as well. We heard a very similar perspective from Julie, who lives in Hamburg and speaks English and Italian at home with her kids. She said it was best to just try and relax, go with the flow and not get too hung up on things like finding bilingual keters because languages can develop, in her words, in different spurts and at different speeds. So everyone's different, but trust that it will happen. I love this. Kids are geniuses. They are. (laughs) (laughs) That they can just pick things up so Mm -hmm, naturally. They can. Any tips that you can share with us from our readers, Imogen? Yeah, there was some really helpful advice our readers passed on to other parents who are hoping to bring up bilingual children. One absolutely key thing was to rely on the German school system, particularly if your child doesn't have a German parent at home. Uh, So lots of people advise parents to really get their children into the German education system as early as possible and just let them learn from these native speakers, which also has the added bonus of teaching the child error and accent-free Germans, really native type German. Meanwhile, readers also unanimously said that parents should stick to speaking their native tongue with their little ones. So stick to your mother tongue within the home and just aim to give the child as immersive an experience as possible by maybe spending time with family members who speak the same language, reading them books in your language, introducing them to music, all of those kinds of things to just really give as much exposure as possible to the native language. And in other words, this is one situation where you don't have to feel stressed or guilty about not speaking German. So (laughs) this is where you get a free pass. Having said that, uh, the general advice was that outside of the home, you really shouldn't stay too much within your sort of monolingual bubble. And there should be at least one parent with maybe decent enough German to be able to communicate with school teachers, overcome these cultural differences and really take an active role in your child's education and upbringing. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. I recently spoke with journalist Rachel Stern about her experience and her tips on bringing up a bilingual child in Germany. So let's listen to that. Rachel, your daughter is obviously very young at this stage, but are you hoping that she grows up speaking English and German? And if so, how are you doing that? Yeah, Rach, I'm definitely hoping that she grows up speaking those two languages. I think it's really a gift to be bilingual at a young age. I did not grow up speaking German and still struggle with the language today. And for her, she can basically pick up the languages naturally. That said, I'm using the so-called OPAL method, one parent, one language. And that's essentially where both me and my husband speak only our mother tongues to her. And so she just gets used to having natural interactions with us in those languages. And I find that it has been pretty effective. Um, Despite her young age, she can speak quite a lot in both of those languages. Oh, that's really cool. So you're speaking English with her and your partner's speaking German. That's right. What are the challenges that you've found so far? Well, because she is so young, sometimes she can't realize what language she's speaking or when she's speaking it. So there is a lot of Danglish that's being used. Sometimes the other day she said, Mama, let's go einkaufen, um, because I think... (laughs) Let's go shopping. Exactly, let's go shopping. Uh, But it's sweet because when she speaks one word more often or associates the task or the action with one parent, then she'll speak that word. So another example was when she wanted to put on her helmet and she told me, I want to 
unschnallen, like I want to fasten the helmet. Um, but for the most part, it's pretty remarkable how she'll just speak English to me um, and just speak German to my husband because she makes that association. And it really is like she's a sponge um, because she's constantly saying new words. Oh my God, that's so cute. <laughs> Do you have any tips or advice for anyone who's hoping that their children will grow up speaking more than one language? Yeah, well, I would say just speak your mother tongue. Um, a lot of parents are living in one country and try to pass on their second language to their kids. But I would say it's the most effective if you're speaking your mother tongue that you have down really well. Um, that said, sometimes you might have two or even three mother tongues. And I think just sticking with one of those is very helpful. Um, to give an example, one of my friends speaks um, English and Hindi as a mother tongue, and she has mostly started speaking Hindi to the kids. Um, so sometimes just having a pattern where you choose a language and speak with it, but you can still make sure that they have exposure in another way is good. So, you know, if both parents only speak English at home and they send their kids to a German daycare or kita, that's a really good way to make sure that the kid is getting the so-called community language. And I've read that before the age of seven, kids will basically just pick up languages without even knowing like, okay, this is English, this is German, this is Spanish, whatever it is. They just associate different languages with different situations. And so I think just speaking and sticking with it and having continuity is a really good way to go. But that said, even for older kids, kids in general can learn languages really fast. So another friend of mine, for example, um, interestingly, also someone with an Indian background, she was speaking English to the kids up until they were four or five and then just said, okay, on the weekend, I'm only going to speak Hindi to them. And now Aww. they're starting to learn the language that way. But they've kind of come to know like, okay, weekends are Hindi time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. Um, really good tips there, Rachel. Thank you so much. And I hope Amelie gets on well with the rest of her language learning. Thanks, me too. <laughs> Right, guys, we're sticking with the theme of language learning. I'm finishing off today with a bit on German noises. So how do you sound more German? Because it's true that each language and even dialects have their own unique kind of little words or noises that people make in everyday conversation. It's not usually the stuff you find in textbooks. So Imogen, you recently worked on an article about this. Can you share a couple of German noises? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so yeah, brilliant. I mean, who knew that you didn't have to learn all those crazy long German words like Hochgeschwindigkeitsgesetz <laughs> uh, in order to sound more German. But apparently, you just need to learn to produce a few little noises. Though I do actually have to say these can be pretty challenging in themselves. Uh, so the first one, one of these I want to talk about is ne. Uh, which is a really handy little noise that you stick at the end of sentences when you're mid-flow, kind of want to check that the other person's still listening or hasn't dropped off to sleep halfway through. Uh, so often you will hear Germans discussing something and punctuating a lot of their sentences with a little no, yeah, 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 no. Absolutely. Um, a bit like we might say, right, you know, or if you're British, isn't it? Doesn't it? So just those ways of checking that the listener is still there. So that's no. Another really great one that fits in a range of situations is puh, puh, which is kind of the German version of our phew. So you'd say it, for example, if you've just managed to make your train, you're a bit tuckered out, but you're relieved the doors close behind you. Or perhaps as you close your laptop at the end of a long and tiring workday, oh, puh, what a day. Was für ein Tag. Um, <laughs> That's a good one. It is a good one. Like I said, great, really versatile for lots of situations. And I think the one most foreigners will very much enjoy using and may perhaps need most often is hair. Yeah, <laughs> I, love, I love this one. <laughs> it's brilliant. So spell with an H and an A with an umlaut. Hair. Now, 
That is exactly what it sounds like. A way of expressing the fact that you're at a complete loss at what the other person is trying to say, either because you don't understand their German or maybe because they've said something you think is a bit, just a bit crazy. You know, someone <laughs> says, oh, you know, I think Donald Trump is an attractive man. And you go, hey? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, so that one is really great to have in your little little arsenal of noises, German noises, and it's a personal favorite of mine. Absolutely love it. Thank you for being so game with those. Paul, do you have a favorite noise or little sound? Nah, yeah. Uh, but I, I like that one. Yeah, yeah. It can it can be yeah. kind of short, like nah, yeah, and then you talk about something, or you could really like draw it out sometimes. Yeah. Nah, yeah. <laughs> nah, yeah. <laughs> nah, yeah. Um, and I would also add to this oopsa, oopsa, yes. oopsa, <laughs> which I just love, which is like oops. Yeah. And and you were also saying, Imogen, there was oopsa, oopsala. Oopsala, Oop, yes. Which is silly. Which apparently just did developed at some point. I've heard that it is the name of a Swedish town or city. Maybe oopsa just became oopsala at some point. So <laughs> some people, if you want to look very silly after you've just kind of dropped a, yeah. something on the floor, you want to make it doubly silly, then oopsala. <laughs> Is enough. your best friend. Yeah. I remember I told my Scottish friends before they visited that, oh, by the way, Germans say oopsa instead of oops when, <laughs> when something happens. And and I mentioned like when they were around my German friends, I was like, don't say that. Just like, because they thought it was so funny. And then he just started going oopsa. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> and Germans were just like, what? That's totally normal. Yeah. But for some reason, it just sounded so funny to us Scottish people. It is a little bit silly. I feel like you you turn what is already a, maybe a slip up into a bit of a slapstick event. The second you start saying like, "oops, Allah. oops Allah. Um, yeah, it's a bit yeah. like sort of cream pie in the face or something. It's "oops." <laughs> That's it for this week. Thank you very much to all our listeners. As always, we will add the links in the show notes for the stories we've been talking about today. And it would mean a lot to us if you hit follow, left a rating or a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. This week's panelists have been Paul Krantz and Imogen Goodman. We also heard from Rachel Stern and our sound engineer is Reese Edwards. I'm Rachel Oxton. We hope you enjoyed listening and we'll be back again next week. Until then, take care.